Thanks for watching this year's presentation on Emerging Trends in Immersive Design. My name is Sean McCoy and I'm Vice President with JRA, an experiential planning and design firm. As I began to prepare for today's session a few months ago, I began to think about not only what trends I've been noticing, but also a framework that may help interpret those trends. So I started researching what factors go into creating and sustaining a trend. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot of theories on the subject, so I decided to create my own. Now before we begin on that theory, a few disclaimers. First of all, I'm not a geneticist, but I'm not above misusing genetic terms as a metaphor, such as, what's the DNA of a trend? Second, I'm not a mathematician, even though the first part of this presentation is based upon the following made-up, complex-sounding polynomial algorithm for determining the FAD trend genome. Now with any equation, you have to start with a known parameter. In this case, let's call X a potential trend, which we'll define as a product, service, action, technology, or technique. We're trying to solve for Y, which is, is this a fad or a trend? But first, what's the difference between a fad and a trend? Let's begin with fads. Fads are present looking. They are quickly adopted and quickly dropped. They are what they are in that they don't evolve or adapt. They do provide value, however, but it's short term. Therefore, they're typically used as a tactic. In short, a fad is a moment. A trend is the exact opposite. They are forward looking, they grow stronger over time, they adapt and evolve, they provide long term value, so they can be used as a foundation for a strategy. A trend doesn't represent a moment, it represents a movement. So trends are good and fads are bad, right? Well no, because again fads do provide value. They've helped fill our closets and stock our garage sales, they exercise our minds and our bodies, they've raised the share value for the makers of Pokemon, and they've raised money for a lot of great causes. So they do provide short-term value and are often a highly visible symbol of a greater underlying trend, such as using viral social media as a fundraising tool, like in the case of the Ice Bucket Challenge. In school, I always try to come up with acronyms to remember things. So here's a short way to help decide if something is a fad. And that is that most fads are fleetingly attractive distractions, meaning that they are really cool things that hold our attention for a short period of time and then they're gone. But to really determine if something is a fad or a trend, we need to go back to our equation, which begins by looking at four key variables. Number one, when assessing a product, service, action, technology, Rx, you should evaluate its attractiveness. Specifically, how enjoyable is it to the mass public? Is it flexible in its use? Can it evolve or adapt over time for new uses? Number two, how accessible is it? Is it relatively affordable and widely available? Number three, are there any underlying cultural trends that it is either responding to or helps to create? And number four, can you produce it efficiently? And perhaps the most important variable, determining its long-term outlook, can someone make money off of it? When putting this all together, we see that first something has to be attractive and accessible. Its longevity is then a factor of its cultural impact and its ability to make money. So let's test this out with two examples. First, let's take a look at fidget spinners, which are extremely popular. And here's why. They're attractive in that they're fun to play with. They're affordable and widely available. While originally developed to soothe autistic children, they're also believed to aid in focus, especially for those with ADHD. So they're aligned with a lot of cultural trends. They're also pretty inexpensive to produce, and a lot of people are making money off of selling them. But are they a fad or a trend? I'd say a fad because of two things. Number one, they're really not flexible in how they're used. And number two, they're really not built to evolve. Conversely, social media checks all of the boxes. Plus, it's flexible in its forms and continues to evolve to adapt to changing market trends and technologies. So again, here's our base equation. But there's one more factor that can be added to our equation, which takes the value of all these variables and amplifies them. And that's what we call an accelerator, which can be described as a person, group, or institution that has the power, determination, and support to accelerate a trend. And there are individuals throughout history who have created trend-setting movements through their vision and determination. Walt Disney brought us the modern theme park through imagination and creativity. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier with dignity and grace. Steve Jobs changed the way we use technology through design and innovation. And Malala Yousafzai brought upon education reform through courage and conviction. And again, these accelerators are those that turn trends into long-lasting movements through their vision, their hard work, and their determination. 
So now that we know the equation, it should be pretty simple to determine if something is a short-term fad or long-term trend, right? Well, not exactly. For example, in 1995, futurist Clifford Stahl wrote a pretty scathing article in Newsweek where he basically said that the internet was overrated and told it to get off my lawn. Here are some of Mr. Stahl's most salient points. How about electronic publishing? We'll soon buy books and newspapers straight over the internet. Uh, sure. Oops. Then there's cyber business. We're promised instant catalog shopping, just point and click for great deals. We'll order airline tickets over the network, make restaurant reservations, and negotiate sales contracts. Stores will become obsolete, so how come my local mall does more business in an afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? Even if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism, salespeople. Double loops. Now to be fair to Mr. Stahl, eBay wasn't even launched until seven months after this article was published. And here's what its home pages looked like when it was first called Auction Web. But Mr. Stahl should have thought about the internet's potential to evolve and adapt through new technologies and to eventually make money. The point is, things change quickly as conveyed by the message of this recent meme. 1998, don't get into strangers' cars. Don't meet people from the internet. 2017, literally summon people from the internet to get into their car. Given how fast things change, it's easy to see why many trend-setting attempts fail. But because those missteps often lead to later success, even these attempts should be celebrated, which is exactly the message of our first case study, the Museum of Failure. This Swedish museum highlights a variety of over 70 failed products and services to provide insight as to the risks associated with innovation. Highlights include flops from several of the world's top companies, such as Crystal Pepsi, Coca-Cola's coffee-flavored black drink, green sauce from Heinz, Harley-Davidson's hot road cologne, and my favorite, a delicious-looking frozen lasagna from, of course, Colgate. The museum also demonstrates that while some products may initially fail, they pave the way for the development of those that go on to great success, such as the case study for one product featured in the museum, Apple's Newton, which Steve Jobs later credited as a stepping stone toward the development of the iPad. New technologies are often the centerpiece of an emerging trend, and one of the more hotly debated technologies out there is virtual reality. Some swear that it's a passing fad, some say it's the future. While the truth is probably somewhere in between, new projects are being added to the VR landscape every day. One such project is a VR coaster called Kraken Unleashed at SeaWorld in Orlando. Using the original track of Kraken, a steel floorless coaster opened in 2000, SeaWorld unveiled a new version of the attraction this past June, turning it into an immersive VR experience. Unlike a lot of current VR coasters, the headset and support equipment are permanently attached to the ride. While most riders opt for the VR experience, you can still ride without it. Those who do use the VR headsets are immediately submersed into an underwater adventure where they race through deep sea canyons and crevices, home of the legendary sea monster. As you'll see from this short clip, all the various hills, dives, and banking turns are perfectly synced to VR media and high energy music, providing guests with a thrilling experience. While VR is being added to existing attractions such as theme parks, there are also a variety of new standalone facilities coming online which are solely dedicated to the VR experience, the most ambitious of which is IMAX VR. The facility operates similar to a movie theater in that you can buy tickets for a variety of titles showing at certain times throughout the day. Current titles range from those based upon movies like Star Wars, Star Trek, and John Wick, plus a variety of generic titles that challenge you to do things like walk a tightrope. Once you get your ticket, you then make your way to one of 14 VR pods. After a short explanation on how to play your selected game, you're then free to enjoy a 5-15 to 15 minute long experience costing between $7 and $10. IMAX plans on adding future centers to theater complexes, with the idea that you visit the VR arcade before or after your movie. New centers are planned for New York, the UK, the Middle East, and Japan. IMAX has also created a $50 million fund to create new content and is working with Google to create a new cinema quality 360 camera to create some of these experiences. A similar VR experience recently opened in Manhattan called VR World. 
The facility also offers a variety of separately ticketed experiences where you can virtually paint, rock climb, or play Fruit Ninja. But its most innovative experience takes one negative aspect of VR, its isolation, and turns it into something truly unique. Called Flatline Emergency Room, this attraction provides guests with an unforgettable simulation of a near-death experience. Visitors relive six different near-death experiences based upon 4,000 interviews collected over the past 30 years about the subject. These scenarios are recreated from the accounts of real people, using their exact words of what they believe happened to them when they flatlined. Here's a brief look at one such experience from 1955. Okay. I recall being pulled down into a spinning vortex. I realized my body was being drawn downward. I panicked and I fought, trying to grab at the sides of the vortex. And all I could think of was my two children. Please not now. Oh. But I kept moving downward. I tried to see something, but all there was to see was this cyclonic void that tapered into a funnel. I kept grabbing at the sides, but my fingers had nothing to grasp. Tamara said it. Guests have remarked that the experience affected them deeply, calling it quasi-spiritual, mystical, amazing, deep, and thought-provoking. In addition to virtual reality and augmented reality, another experience being offered today is called mixed reality or hyper-reality, where virtual media and physical interaction are mixed. And these mixed reality centers are popping up around the world, such as VR Park Tokyo, where guests can go on a number of short mixed reality adventures. They can play baseball, navigate a magic carpet ride, take a parachute adventure through a jungle, or my favorite, can you guess what she's doing? Well, she's saving a kitten 30 stories in the air. More and more museums are adding VR experiences to deliver their content in innovative ways. Recently, the Tate Modern unveiled their Modiglione exhibit, which not only showcases the Italian artist's works in a traditional manner, but also uses virtual reality to immerse visitors in 1920s Paris, where he really came into his own as an artist. If one of the key factors in whether a technology will sustain itself in the long term is its ability to be used in a variety of ways, then VR is well positioned, as it's being used for much more than entertainment. For example, researchers have found that VR can help diagnose and treat those suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. Researchers say that the information that they get from observing a patient's cognitive ability in just two minutes of virtual gameplay is equivalent to five hours of lab study. For those suffering from dementia, VR can be used to help restore and build brain functions. Patients visit familiar places through Google Earth, which helps to restore their memories. Plus, these virtual visits help to spark conversations with their families and caregivers, which not only adds to the patient's well-being, but also helps to strengthen their brain functions. VR can also be used for pain management. For example, Snow World is a VR game designed specifically to distract patients while they undergo painful treatments. Recent studies show that patients who play the game during treatment report up to 50% less pain than similar patients not playing the game. As some of you may know, Facebook bought the VR hardware company Oculus in 2014 for $2 billion, illustrating Mark Zuckerberg's belief in VR's long-term viability. The company recently released their new Spaces software that helps to turn VR into a more social experience. Currently in beta testing, users of Spaces first create a virtual avatar. They then select a 360-degree environment to visit, which can either be a static picture, a pre-recorded video, or a live stream. They then can invite friends to meet them in the selected space where they can communicate in real time, share pictures, draw pictures, or even take a virtual selfie. Let's take a look. Hey, sis. Hey, Jack. Are you all excited for our trip? Yeah, and look what I found. <gasps> this is so cool. Is this the same spot we're going to? I hope so. And look, I think that's where we're taking the boat tour. Oh! Oh, I love it. Look, I'm gonna go chat with Melissa, but you're setting up the party room, right? Yeah, I got it. Great, see you later, Jack. All right, see you later. Bye. Hey, girl. Guess what? What? I got the apartment. Wow, nice. Look at your balcony. I know, it's amazing. No roommates. <laughs> I have it all planned out. The lucky blue couch. Yes. This table with this floor. Perfect. <laughs> Jack keeps calling me. Can we talk later? Sure. Bye. Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> Happy birthday! Thanks, you guys. Happy birthday. Oh, stop. Don't try to like this song. OK, hold this balloon. You know we got to do it. Birthday selfie. Oh, my god. <laughs> Don't forget your birthday hat. 
As mentioned earlier, opinions on VR differ greatly, especially in the attractions industry. For example, Dave & Buster's recently announced that the chain would be investing heavily in VR in the coming year. Conversely, Disney CEO Bob Iger is not a fan of the technology, and reportedly told his engineers, don't even think about it when it comes to VR. Disney is a fan, however, of AR, and recently released its Jedi Challenges augmented reality system just in time for Christmas. The kit costs $200 and includes a headset, a lightsaber controller, and a tracking beacon. The user's smartphone provides the processing power and also projects the AR imagery on the inside lens of the headset. Users can battle such adversaries as Kylo Ren and Darth Vader himself in a lightsaber duel. They can marshal rebellion forces in a combat strategy game, or even play a relaxing game of hollow chess. Here's Jedi Challenges. That's why I was always Vader and you were always Obi-Wan. Okay, Star Wars universe aside, all that really matters is that I'm better than you. Well, you know what? Why don't we just go settle it? But I go first. Oh. Your fate will be like that of old Jedi. It's my turn. Wait, this is a new fighting style? Playing hollow chest. I am. Well done. A well placed attack. Train my mind. I must. While Disney is currently focusing its AR efforts on the at-home experience, Cedar Fair is having success with in-park AR experiences. Based on last year's award-winning Battle for Cedar Point app, Battle for King's Dominion provides guests with a layer of personalized gamification to their park visit. First, guests must choose and join an alliance, each represented by a character inspired by the park's various roller coasters. They then can personalize their avatar and battle against other clans to see who dominates the park throughout the day. Various augmented reality experiences are embedded throughout the park, from the ride queues to the souvenir shops to various interactive experiences, providing guests with a continuous and personalized experience. Guests can also post their experience on social media and continue to interact with the app after they've returned home for the day. The result is that Cedar Fair is not only engaging their guests throughout their visit, but also continue to interact with them at home. Museums are also finding great ways to incorporate AR into their galleries, allowing guests to see history in new, engaging ways. Here are two such experiences which just opened in Texas. The key pieces of the LaBelle exhibit at the Texas State History Museum is the preserved hull of the LaBelle ship. We reached out to the client and said, hey, we've got this great idea. LaBelle is simply about visualizing what is not there. We could superimpose the ship model over the actual hull. To actually stand in the museum and see it to scale, as tall as it would have been with the masts and the rigging and the sails. It brought the artifact to life in a way I would have never been able to experience it. In the case of LBJ, it's really about using the space as a platform. They have a very large archive wall, so we created the ability to pull information out of that wall, bring it down to the viewer's level, and let them walk around it, walk among it, read letters, look at photographs, and bring uh, what was a static view of all these documents to life. So this technology is going to allow us to engage visitors in ways that they've never experienced before. This is a way to bring to life static elements. It 
that allows us to enhance the physical environment while still allowing visitors to uh, stay connected to each other. The future of augmented reality in museums is enormous. The results of our test, I think, proved that augmented reality is here to stay. Sometimes a trend can prove its value from its ability to evolve beyond its initial intent. Take projection mapping. While the tools may have changed, the technology itself has almost become commonplace, with shows projected on everything, from train stations, to cruise ships, to Cinderella's castle. It's been used in a myriad of ways, to advertise, inform, or simply entertain. But 13 months ago, a group of civic and community leaders came up with the idea of creating a multi-day festival in Cincinnati's downtown and over the Rhine neighborhoods. The festival would feature projection mapping, murals, light installations, and interactive art. It would attract people to come to the urban core and build on the city's many art assets. It would be car free, where people walked, biked, or rode the streetcar together. And it would be free and open to the public. Organizers had hoped that the inaugural Blink Festival would attract half a million visitors to downtown over its four day run. But when they saw 100,000 spectators lined up for Blink's opening night parade, they knew that they had created something special. Festival attendees were treated to 70 installations, spanning 20 city blocks. Printed maps and a mobile app helped visitors navigate the enormity of the festival, and people, many of whom had never met each other before, would band together to explore what was around the next corner. Beyond merely observing, festival goers could dance at a light-infused disco, participate in glow-in-the-dark yoga, or engage with dozens of interactive, illuminated art pieces. The economic, cultural, and civic pride value of Blink shattered all expectations. Over one million people attended Blink, making it the largest projection mapping and light festival in the United States, and the largest event in downtown Cincinnati's history. And despite the massive crowds, there was not a single police incident. Even months later, the festival is still leaving its mark, both literally and figuratively. Murals commissioned for the festival and created by artists from around the world will last for many years to come. Cincinnatians who rarely ventured downtown are now making plans to return and bring friends. And a city that has often suffered from a lack of self-confidence can look upon the future with a renewed sense of possibility. As this short video beautifully conveys, this was more than just a projection mapping and illuminated art show. Blink brought people together, lifted up a community, and created a sense of shared optimism for an entire city. Here's Blink. I thought there would never be enough space in my heart for two skylines. But my relationship with Cincinnati grew on me like an arranged marriage. I even started correcting people's spelling. Cincinnati, that's two N's, not two T's. And just like that, in the blink of an eye, I became tethered to the architecture. Started listening to the echo in the sidewalk as it tells the story of a people stampede over the river, over the Rhine. And though I'm not from here, last night felt close to home as I watched an entire city block stretch its arms like a limousine and hold the door open for me to walk in. What a sight to see, every wall, every face lit up, shedding light on more than just brick in the streets. Toddlers laugh and grandparents smile and glow sticks and misconception fall to the ground. The whole town expanding like a slow inhale. Blink and you can miss your chance to see the syllables from redemption skipping through the streets. When a city draws a self-portrait, you don't always see its true colors. But what city ain't got disparity or discrimination or distance between where it is and where it wants to go? But I know that this city has seen pigs fly, so surely it can see an end to homelessness because no one wants to be forgotten. But everyone needs an excuse to remember. It takes a village to change a city. And last night, I caught a glimpse of everyone singing in unison for something more. A little one yells, but I don't wanna go home. And for a split second, neither do I. If you were to ask me what technology will have the most impact, not only on our industry, but our lives in the next 20 years, my answer would be very simple, artificial intelligence. By its simplest definition, artificial intelligence, or AI, is a simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems. Examples in our daily lives include Siri, Alexa, Echo, and self-driving cars. One of the powerful benefits of AI is its ability to process, interpret, and learn from a large amount of information in order to achieve a particular goal. 
And if you think about it, both AI and museums are built upon a similar premise, in that they are not just collecting, but also interpreting and learning from a myriad of information. Therefore, it's easy to see why there might be some synergies between the two. IBM recently worked with an art museum in Brazil to test that theory using their supercomputer, Watson. O grande desafio para nós era relacionar a inteligência artificial com a arte. Porque normalmente em museu você encontra o quê? Aquele rádiozinho que você vai ouvindo. Você não interage de fato. That's why IBM and Pinacoteca created, with Watson's help, an application where people can literally talk to art. Curators and educators have researched about the history of Brazilian art with books, texts, interviews, biographies, old newspapers, and even current issues related to the art pieces. Then IBM spent six months teaching it to Watson so it could talk about each one of the paintings and sculptures. Qual o contexto histórico dessa obra? Quantas bananeiras tem no bananal? E você gosta de jogar futebol? Em 1934, o futebol já era um enorme sucesso no Brasil, mas trabalhando duro na lavoura. O mestiço provavelmente não tinha tempo para jogar. Por que, que é um amor impossível? O que são as duas figuras no quadro? Qual estilo de pintura foi usada nessa obra? O bananal é uma mistura de dois estilos. O expressionismo é visto nas distorções da figura humana e o cubismo no paredão de folhas. Então eu acho super válido conversar com essa arte de uma forma direta, podendo fazer perguntas totalmente malucas, não tendo vergonha das perguntas que ela pode colocar. Quantos anos ele tem? Essa obra é de 1967. Se estivesse vivo, esse porco teria 50 anos e seria o porco mais velho do mundo. De quem você tem saudade? Alguns elementos podem nos ajudar. O chapéu pendurado na parede indica que tinha um homem na casa. A foto em suas mãos, as lágrimas em seu rosto e as roupas pretas nos levam a crer que esse homem morreu. Tem a ver muito comigo, porque eu tenho saudade do meu pai. Muita. Disney is arguably unsurpassed in its ability to create blockbuster movies and franchises, especially with its Pixar and Marvel collection of films. And AI helps to ensure that they keep that streak going. For example, Disney uses AI to keep track of all the various characters and storylines from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, helping to determine which films should be made and which characters should be featured. Disney also wants to make sure that you laugh and cry at the right times while watching their films. One way that they achieve this is through advanced facial recognition technology. Using sensors set up within their screening theaters, the faces of audience members are scanned to record their facial expressions. Within 10 minutes of scanning, the technology can predict an audience member's reaction for the rest of the film. And if a majority of the audience is, say, yawning when they should be engaged in a scene, then the filmmakers know that they have some edits or rewrites to make. Disney recently filed a patent to use similar technology in their ride systems. Basically, sensors in the ride detect your emotions, and the ride can change to give you a more enjoyable experience that is specifically suited to your tastes. That approaching skeleton on your dark ride a bit too intense? Well, then your emotions are recognized and your next scene will be changed in real time to be a little bit more playful, say to a fairy sitting underneath a giant toadstool. As I'm sure a lot of you know, attractions based upon well-known intellectual property, or IP, have become extremely popular. A good indication of the popularity of IP can be seen in New York, where new branded attractions are opening one after another. Such as National Geographic's Ocean Odyssey, which opened last October, to the NFL experience, and an exhibition on Downton Abbey, both of which just opened in November. But in the world of theme parks, one IP changed the way in which guests are immersed within a story. And that IP is? That's right, Harry Potter. Opened in 2010 at Universal's Islands of Adventure, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter set a new standard for immersive design. And now is the bar against which new theme lands are compared. Fast forward to today in 2017, or 7 AP, after Potter, and Disney has taken world building to the next level with Pandora, the world of Avatar. The land is set roughly 100 years after the events of the film. A fictional ecotourism company has been charged with inspiring Pandora's visitors to learn about the planet's environment and to make efforts to conserve it. It is from this narrative foundation that Pandora's layers of story are built. Visitors are instantly immersed in the Valley of Moara. Floating mountains tower 156 feet in the air. Audio recordings of Pandoran animals provide ambient noise and interspersed between are natural plants and 20 species of flora that Imagineers specifically created for the attraction. 
Throughout the land, you sense the historical conflict between nature and industry. Among the landscape, you see ruined buildings and equipment, some of which have been repurposed to serve you, the eco-tourist, from the Satuli Canteen to the Pongo Pongo Refreshment Bar, even to the restrooms. Equally important is what you don't see. Bright attraction marquees are replaced with signs made with wood and rope. At the Wind Traders retail shop, there are no Toy Story souvenirs or Mickey Mouse ears, for you are on Pandora. Navi woven baskets or military equipment cases are used to display products like drums or beaded necklaces. All the land's retail outlets are designed to stay in story. As are the land's food and beverage outlets. At the canteen, wine and pizza have been replaced by night blossoms, think Pandora and butterbeer, and rainforest to table cuisine. To further immerse you in the story, Disney's cast members take on a character within the Pandora universe, acting as tour guides or expats who came to Pandora from Earth and never left. Both of these groups have extensive knowledge of the world's history and are eager to share it. In order to make these layers of story building blend into a singular cohesive narrative, the creators knew that there had to be one unifying element, a character that gave the land its mission and its story a reason to exist. And that character is you. Your role in the overall story is just as important as the Na'vi or Pandora itself. Instead of a movie set peppered with recognizable characters, you are in the equivalent of a national park on an alien world. You are Pandora's explorer and steward. You drive the story. And at night, that story changes as Pandora takes on a completely different look. Any trace of mankind seems to fall away as the natural world takes center stage. Every aspect of the landscape comes alive in a bioluminescent glow. In the Navi River Journey Dark Ride attraction, a boat guides you down a Pandoran River where you'll meet Disney's most advanced audio animatronic to date, who sings about the interconnectedness of nature and its inhabitants. Flight of Passage, the land's signature attraction, brings you into the heart of the Pandoran Conservation Initiative, immersing you in its lab. Through a link chair and a pair of 3D night goggles, you are connected to an avatar. Then off you fly. The technology disappears, and you are soaring through Pandora on the back of a banshee, wind and mist in your face. The CG landscapes you see throughout the ride mesh perfectly with the dimensional scenery you've previously seen in the park, creating a seamless link between the digital and the real. You are fully immersed in the story. With its layers of story building and focus on the guests as center to the experience, the world of Avatar achieves several goals. It underscores the overall mission of the Animal Kingdom Park, environmental stewardship and conservation. This is why you find the land here and not in Disney's Hollywood Studios. But most important, whether you loved or hated the movie on which the land is based, or never even saw it, the attraction stands alone as a destination that offers something for everyone. Pandora's commitment to keeping every touch point within its story represents the biggest trend in the attraction's industry, world building. The scary thing is that Disney's next project will take this to yet another level. When Star Wars opens in 2019, it will certainly set an even higher standard for guest immersion. With that, we've come to an end of this year's look at some of the more exciting trends and technologies in the leisure and cultural industry. As you can see, it's a really exciting time to be planning, designing, and operating attractions. Through the help of advancing technologies, there's almost no limit to the ways in which we can place our guests in the center of the story as the driver of their own narrative. I know we've covered a lot today, 174 slides to be exact, but I hope you remember how to tell the difference between a fad and a trend, and that even fads provide value. I hope you remember that there's even value in failure, for to try something bold is the only way to achieve innovation. But what I really hope is that you are as inspired as I am about what's possible, and that I get to showcase your projects in future presentations. Thanks again for watching.